will discuss altitude sickness and how to minimize it since I'm considering to summit a couple of mountains this year. And hopefully this will um, help uh, someone who is uh, considering to ascend to an elevation and also who's considering to summit other uh, summit mountains this year. So the content synopsis of this vlog is to identify what altitude sickness is, recognize it, implement interventions, and prevent altitude sickness. So first of all, um, I'd like to let you know that the reason why I did this research is I I'm pretty knowledgeable in researching stuff. So my background is I've been a pediatric nurse practitioner for more than 10 years. I've worked in anesthesia, pulmonology, cardiac intensive care, cardiology, primary care, and international pediatric care. And my medical background has been uh, more than 15 years across the lifespan. So to define it, acute or altitude mountain sickness, it is a condition where you have low oxygen levels because of rapid altitude change called hypoxia without time to acclimate. You experience hypoxic stress because of the elevation due to the decreased atmospheric pressure, the rate of ascent, and the duration of exposure. Uh, the body needs to uh, to changing pr adjust to the changing pressure, which is lower, and oxygen level at a certain elevation. Acclimatization takes three to five days, and it's better to acclimate at 8,000 or 9,000 feet or 2,500 to 2,750 meters first before going up some more. And so when you ascend, the body has the automatic response to increase how you breathe called ventilation. So this is very important so your body can adjust to the elevation. There are three types called acute mountain sickness, high altitude pulmonary edema, high altitude cerebral edema. The acute mountain sickness is most common for travelers or trekkers. The onset is above altitude of 1980 meters or 6,500 feet. And it's, uh, they show headaches and happens two to 12 hours after the arrival. There's a decreased appetite, insomnia, fatigue, and nausea. The high altitude pulmonary edema, which is the HAPE, is the fluid in the lungs. Uh, between 5 and 10% of patients with acute mountain sickness progress to HAPE, which occurs when the small pulmonary blood vessels leak, allowing fluid accumulation in the lungs. And the mortality from HAPE ranges from 11 to 44%. The high the HACE, which is the high altitude cerebral edema, is fluid in the brain. The, rela the related condition, HACE, occurs when the fluid accumulation in the brain causes increased pressure within the skull. And neurologic signs such as confusion and coma may be noted. So uh, life depends on, as we know it, on water, carbon, uh, multiple minerals, temperature, oxygen, and end product of um, carbon dioxide. The partial pressure of oxygen in the inspired air, which is PI PiO2, just to make this a little simple, at sea level, um, the PiO2 is 149 millimeters of mercury at a pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury. The pressure goes down with high altitude. The PiO2 becomes 94 millimeters of mercury at a partial uh, barometric pressure of 495 millimeters of mercury. So um, the oxygen transport in the body, which is the pneumodynamic pump, the hemoglobin in your cells uh, pump, and the hemoglobin also are important with adapting to high altitude. So normally, the hemoglobin in your cells plays a basic role in the capture and transport of oxygen. This hemodynamic pump plays this role of transporting this hemoglobin with oxygen from the lungs to the mitochondrial cells in your body. So as blood returns to the lungs, your body circulation transport this carbon dioxide to the lungs for exhalation, and it maintains adequate levels of acid-base status in your body, which is a pH of 7.4, so your body does not become acidotic. So um, this looks a little complicated, but this is the uh, diagram of the hypoxic ventilator support, which is the automatic response of the body to um, hypoxia. It's guided by the carotid body. It tells the medulla in the brain where the respiratory center is to increase ventilation. And it, uh, what it occurs is respiratory alkalosis. There is a renal excretion of bicarbonate compensates to maintain normal pH in the body. The hypoxemia states alters this homeostasis, uh, causing fluid retention. So it suppresses suppressing antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone, leading to diuresis. So then the hemoglobin concentration is increased within 48 hours because of this diuresis and decreased plasma volume and increasing um, pulmonary artery resistance uh, caused by exercise.
The adaptation to the hypoxic state requires synergistic functioning of the lungs, the heart, and the hematologic system of the human body in order to enhance the availability of oxygen at the cellular level. It is then advisable that hikers or trekkers have adequate sleep and rest a couple of days prior to ascending and definitely no alcohol intake within 48 hours since this is a respiratory depressant. So as you can see at 10,000 feet or 3,000 meters above sea level, the inspired PO2 is more than two thirds, which is 69% what it is at sea level. So you can imagine it at Cusco, La Paz, Everest Base Camp, Kilimanjaro, and Himalayas. The altitude sickness um, starts at 8,000 feet, which is 2,500 meters or higher. It can be different for other people. It can affect them much earlier. So training or physical fitness do not affect risk, but increases endurance. So it doesn't really prepare you for the um, change in altitude, but it actually increases your um, your physical exercise, be having an active lifestyle. So clinical presentation, um, as already mentioned before, the acute mountain sickness, which is the altitude mountain sickness, presents with headache, fatigue, loss of appetite, nausea, sometimes vomiting, increased heart rate, pin and needle sensation, swelling of extremities, and it usually resolves within 24 to 48 hours of acclimatization. The HACE, which is a severe progression of um, acute mountain illness, uh, sickness, uh, shows with lethargy, drowsiness, confusion, ataxia, on tandem gait, tests, headache without relief, and numbness, and it can be very fatal, and death can occur. The HAPE, which is breathlessness uh, with, with exertion, um, persistent dry cough, and it can be fatal than the HACE. So ascending is not advisable to people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, pulmonary hypertension, with pulmonary artery systolic pressure of more than 60 millimeters of mercury, unstable angina, high-risk pregnancy, cystic fibrosis with forced expiratory volume of less than 30% predicted, uh, myocardial infarction, stroke, any cerebral space occupying lesion, always consult with your doctor if you're considering to summit or go up or ascend to an elevation. So what is considered a low-risk uh, altitude um, mountain sickness? Uh, those people without prior history and ascending to less than 9,000 feet, which is 2750 meters, uh, people taking more than two days to arrive at 8,200 to 9,800 feet, which is 2,500 to 3,000 meters, and an extra day for acclimatization every 3,000 feet um, or 1,000 meters, and the acetylzalamide um, is not indicated for this. For moderate risk, prior history in ascending to 8,200 to 9,200 feet, which is about 2,500 to 2,800 meters or higher in one day. So people going up more than 1,600 feet, which is 500 meters per day, acetylzalamide is indicated. The high risk are history and going up history and going up to 9,200 feet, which is 2,800 meters um, in a, in one day. History of HAPE or HACE, very rapid ascent, um, i.e., less than seven days to Mount Kilimanjaro, and acetylzalamide is definitely uh, recommended for this. There are treatments and interventions or um, chemo prophylaxis that are recommended uh, for someone who wants to summit or go up and ascend to an elevation. One is the acetylzalamide. It's a, uh, a prescription drug uh, that hastens adaptation and reduce symptoms of the altitude sickness. In serious cases, descent to lower altitude is very important. Um, the drug works by acidifying the blood and reducing the respiratory alkalosis associated with high elevations. And what it does is they increase, it increases, your body increases respiration and arterial oxygenation and speeding up um, acclimatization. The dexamethasone, which is a steroid, is effective for preventing and treating the acute um, mountain sickness and the HACE, and it prevents HAP as well. Unlike acetozolamide, if the drug is discontinued at elevation before acclimatization, mild rebound can occur. Uh, this is usually reserved at the, on the summit day on high peaks such as Kilimanjaro in order to prevent abrupt altitude illness. Uh, Nifedipine has also been considered. It's a calcium channel blocker that prevents HAPE, and for prevention, it is generally reserved for people who are particularly susceptible to the condition. Uh, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor and medications have been considered for HAP prevention uh, because it lowers pulmonary artery pressure, less effect on systolic blood pressure, and they are tadalafil or sildenafil. The ibuprofen has been considered as well. It's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication. It's not inferior to acetylzalamide in preventing the acute uh, 
mountain sickness, but does not improve acclimatization or reduce periodic breeding. So other treatments, um, you know, if you're in a group, um, they usually bring oxygen with them. Um, they have supposedly a gamo bag that is a portable hyperbaric chamber if descending immediately is not possible. Um, uh, two to four days to acclimate or more because the serum erythropoietin level increases. Don't go more than 9,000 feet, which is 2750 meters in one day. And then once above 9,000 feet, then move to 1,600 feet, which is 500 meters per day, and plan extra day every 3,300 feet, which is 1,000 meters. No alcohol for the first 48 hours. Continue caffeine and mild exercise only for the first uh, 48 hours. Yoga and meditation has been suggested as well if you're into complementary therapy. Uh, yoga, uh, according to researchers, the yogic breathing was found to be helpful in maintaining oxygenation in the hyperbaric chambers equivalent to 5,000 meters in altitude. There was a study done, um, and it's called SKY Yogic Practices. Um, what, they did, what they did is they took 48 subjects, 20 to 65 years of age without comorbidities uh, were recruited. Uh, the study was approved in uh, by the institutional ethics committee um, in the um, and then they were enrolled uh, in India. So they were enrolled in the Art of Living Advanced Meditation Program in uh, La India, and they used uh, some kind of a meditation protocol of the SKY, which is a yogic yogic practices. Uh, a protocol included nine rounds of like pranayam, guided meditation, set of eighteen yoga sanas, followed by three stage pranayama, and what they called. Uh, Bastrika and Sudarshan Kriya Yoga. And so based on the, the results, based on the, I guess, the physiological and vital measurements at the body that included blood pressure, PO2, vital signs, and many others, increased PO2, mark reduction in anxiety, and there were uh, mental well-being and happiness index apparently improved. The result then, they said, is if yoga and or meditation is implemented, it is effective with acclimatization and synergistic with conventional medicine. Prevention is the key. Know the early symptoms of altitude illness and be willing to tell someone. Never ascend to sleep at a higher elevation with symptoms of altitude illness, no matter how minor it is. Descend if the symptoms become worse while resting at an elevation. It, it is very crucial to the reduction of morbidity and mortality from altitude sickness. Uh, when you're ascending, it should be very slow, especially those involving physical exertion like hiking. Sedatives and salt should be avoided. Um, alcohol should be avoided for the first uh, 48 hours. Most people adapt to altitude changes within three days. And return to lower alt altitudes at night is advisable. So that's it, everyone. I hope this helps anyone who's considering to summit any, any mountain or ascend to a higher elevation. I'll, I'll see you guys again in the next adventure.